different from the other previous talk about the non-unions. Very interesting cases, very good cases. Thank you so much for this uh, present for presenting these complex cases. So my topic today is about the uh, some of the basics, uh, and uh, because of the time, uh, we will just go over some of the pediatric fractures, the most common pediatric fractures. I have the talk extending about the elbow fractures, femur, tibia, and physial fractures of the ankle, but I don't think the time will, uh, will be available for all of that. We can do another talk later on. So we try to uh, cover today the principles of the pediatric fractures. So pediatric fractures are very common, uh, represent in the United States around 200,000 playground uh, related injuries, uh, over 250,000 bike related injuries every year, 200,000 trampoline related injuries, and kids can do crazy stuff and can they hurt them themselves very, very common. So, and the uh, pediatric fractures or pediatric injuries uh, represent about 20, 12 to 15 percent of the emergency room visit each year and it represents significant cost and morbidity to the healthcare system and it includes a wide variety of injuries from birth up to 16 years old or 18 years old all this kind of injuries uh, there is uh, one of the uh, main features of pediatric fractures that we should understand that pediatric fra children are not young adults is very different have a very different characteristic from adults and we should treat them as a particular group of patients with the someone who trained how to manage pediatric fractures. So pediatric fractures are less dense, uh, less stiff, more porous, often uh, bend before breaking, plastic deformations. They have a gross split injuries and fractures in each and uh, in each side of long bones and this is, can act as a weakness and also can give potential for, uh, for remodeling uh, have a thicker periosteum, you know, can be sometimes your, your friend to help with the reduction, sometimes get entrapped into the fracture, can be your enemy, and have a great uh, remodeling uh, potentials. So I see this is a clavicle fractures in uh, on uh, the children, young child, and this is treated non-operatively, and we see uh, during the follow-up in the last picture on the bottom right, uh, the complete healing and remodeling of the fracture site. The same thing around for wrist fracture, for this radius, this radius fractures. There's some tolerance for uh, remodeling and you can see the pictures. The fracture is really, uh, very well remodeled and uh, no deformity, he fully healed. Uh, the kid is doing very well. And remodeling depend on the uh, age of the child, the uh, plane of the deformity and the proximity to the physis and the activity of the adjacent physis. The closer the fracture to the physis, is the greater potential for remodeling. And this is another example for remodeling, especially proximal humerus to the right side and this radius on the left side. When you go around elbow injuries, the remodeling capacity is very, uh, very limited. Uh, physel fractures, uh, usually physel fracture happen uh, before uh, injury to the ligaments because this is the path of least resistance and it's the biomechanical of weak spots and they contribute for remodeling and healing of the fracture site uh, in uh, the metaphysis or uh, diaphyseal fractures. You can see this is also, you can see the, uh, uh, just as uh, some of mechanical differences between uh, pediatric and adults, that is more porous, uh, less dense, and the, uh, I'm sorry, more porous and less dense, and this is one of the major difference between uh, child and uh, adult fractures. This is also the classification. All of us, I'm, I'm sure, are familiar with Salter Harris classifications, and the management differ uh, according to the classification of the physial fractures. And we can see this is the physial fractures. All this slide, very, very important, come to the test when uh, Salter Harris number one and two happen to the hypertrophic zone, and Salter three and four, the injuries happen through affecting the resting zone with higher incidence of gross arrest and deformity and uh, the need for complex treatment for uh, deformity erections, limb lengthening, as we see in this picture, the gross arrest of the distal tibial physis after physial fracture. And uh, the other feature of the fracture is the periosteum. Periosteum, and as we can see, this is sobracondyl fracture. It's very helpful to maintain the posterior hinge of the elbow can help with the reduction without the need for open reduction. However, in this fracture for, tri uh, for the distal tibial physial injuries, you can see widening after reduction 
the very osteum entrapped into the fracture site and didn't help with the reduction. Actually, it's your enemy at this uh, X-ray, so you have to go up and open the fracture. Uh, we have we have to uh, evaluate the patient very uh, thoroughly to make sure that the patient has no compartment syndrome, and I'm sure that all of you are aware with the classic uh, features, uh, symptom-wise, physical exam-wise, and compartment syndrome for compartment syndrome. So we can see. Um, the clinical signs in children is an anxiety, is analgesia, that analgesia, the need for pain medication is increasing and agitation, one of the features for compartment syndrome in children. Uh, should be aware of child abuse. Uh, all of us practice in internationally different, different countries and each country has different rules about the child abuse but you have to be aware for the certain fractures that suggesting child abuse. So children fractures, femur fractures in non ambulatory child is a child abuse case. Transphysial fractures in the very young immature child uh, is a child abuse. And metaphysical corner fractures I see in this X-ray is a child abuse case, multiple rib fractures, for different fractures, different stage of healing uh, and the skin burning as signs of a child abuse. Be aware of this. This is uh, just a a feature or a clinical feature or some x-rays for the child abuse, including subarachnoid hemorrhage in the children and skull fractures. Uh, the other features of that we should understand for pediatric fractures that can be treated most of the time non-operative with casting and the splintic technique. And let's go over very quickly about the basic of casting and splinting. Just to remind everybody, casting is not easy, is not benign. It's intervention, can cause problem, can cause complications. You have to be aware of the complication of casting. It's very, very important as you do the surgery as well. You have to pay attention to the details for applying casting. So that we say, as, as I said, just said, most of the fractures can be managed uh, very well in, uh, in, ca in casting. So materials options for cast could, can be fiberglass, can feed plaster, Plaster is a cheaper, can be molded very well to the fracture, but heavier, radio uh, opaque, and can cause uh, issues with x-rays. Uh, however, it's less irritating to the exposed skin. Fiberglass is uh, more colorful, lighter, need the le least um, color options, uh, less a chance of thermal injury, and less messy, it doesn't contaminate the area you are working in. And just at this, you have to be have the tools for casting, have you ready for casting, especially for resident and junior doctors have to have the tools for applying the cast, that just the stock in it, and the uh, cast padding, the web roll, and different, have to choose your cast with a proper, uh, uh, with a proper size of the casting material. And then water temperature, if you are beginner, try to use a little bit colder water. If you are advanced and have uh, multiple cases to do and in rush, you can use warmer water. We have to be aware of the room te of the temperature of the water play an uh, important role in casting. This is how to roll the cast. Not, don't ball belly tight, just hang with the, with the weight of the, of the roll of the casting. And uh, we can see this is just the uh, details about applying the cast, how to the mold. And this is very important to criticize yourself uh, the cast index, you do the x-ray measurement on the EP and measure, uh, me measure letter B first A and measure on the EP or uh, B and they divide both. They have to be a less than uh, or around 0 0.7 to give you an idea that you did a very good molding of cast and you can see this picture. So you have to keep the ulnar border uh, straight and this is the interosseous mold for the forearm fractures. This is just the molding, detail about the molding. Casting extension is not common, but can be used in elecrum fractures, posterior montegia, flexion type of supracondyl fractures, and the proximal and proximal butthole forearm. And this is just how to do the cast removal. Cast removal is very important as cast application. Have pay attention and be careful. And you can see in this video how you use your finger. This is your finger as a secondary checkpoint to avoid uh, burning the skin with the casting. So have to pay attention all of that. And this is the uh, cast spreader, have to bivalve the cast, take the cast off. That's a lot of work. And just show you some examples of good cast versus bad casting. So this is a good cast, well molded, minimal cast batting, proper length, no wrinkles of materials, and no area of focal pressure. That is the thumb print. 
and bad cast. Then you can see no mold, impro uh, no mold or improper mold, excessive batting, too short or too long, wrinkles of wrinkling of material and focal pressure points. And uh, this is the good cast and this is bad cast. And the same thing for the lower extremity with the ankle pressure point around the heel. And this is you uh, to be aware for cast by valving the cast in case of a swelling. This is just using the wedging for the cast if there's a potential for a swelling. And you have to make a check for a check the cast, cast a check for tightness, for cracks, for dents, for softening, for drainage, for slipping. All these details have to be attention for this uh, uh, problem with the cast. Itchy cast is common. You have to teach the patients that the patient is have an itchy cast. You can use antihistaminics or gent gently tap the itchy area or use a blow dryer to help with the itching of the cast. And this is just uh, remember or remind the patients uh, to avoid weight bearing if this is the indication for non weight bearing or too touch weight bearing. You can see the cast is not always benign, can cause problems, can cause disasters, especially diabetic patients, patient with peripheral vascular disease, patient with the uh, don't complain too much. You have to pay attention to the details of the casting to avoid this complication as we see in this picture. And we like our patient to be happy patient like this patient, uh, good color for cast, smiling, no pain, happy with the cast treatment. So they like to come to the hospital, come to the doctor and talk to, to us and, uh, and happy, happy patients. So I try to uh, discuss one of the fractures, depending on the time, I have multiple topics. We can just discuss the uh, subracondal fractures, the most common elbow injuries in children. Uh, and we, uh, the, we can just start about this. The elbow fractures, subracondal fracture, the most common fracture in children, mostly affecting around five to seven years old. Uh, the most common uh, injuries fall from uh, trampoline or monkey bars or whatever gymnastics, whatever uh, the fall is, okay? And the, uh, the most common surgical, uh, if, if most of the time, this fracture need uh, surgical intervention, as we discussed in the remodeling, that the, the rate of growth of the upper extremity from the elbow is very minimal, around 20%, and the potential for remodeling for subracondral fractures is very, uh, very limited. That's why we are very aggressive in treating these fractures with the uh, surgical or operative fixation rather than uh, casting reduction and stuff like that. So we have to pay attention to the physical exam, especially for open fractures, for the ecchymosis around the uh, anticubital area. Look for the amount of the deformity. And the most important thing you need to look for is the color of the hand and the radial pulsations or the peripheral pulsations. And depending on this, you will decide if the patient needs to go to the surgery emergent or urgent or the following day. You will know the uh, from the clinical exam. And see, this is the most important physical sign, the brachialis sign, which is anti cubital ecchymosis, skin buckering, subcutaneous bone fragment, which means that the metaphysis of the of the shaft of the humerus is penetrating through the brachialis, stretching the brachial artery causing muscle damage, causing open wound. So this is indicator of a significant injury and the swelling, and is one of the risk factors for potential failure of closed uh, reduction. Most of the time require milking maneuver. We will discuss it later on. So you have to look for the vascular injury is common. You have to uh, look for this, for the uh, capillary filling, most obvious. So you have to check for the color of the hand and you look for the uh, peripheral pulsations, very, very important, either, either palpation or by doubler, and you have to check the uh, peripheral pulsations. And uh, after examination, you have to pulse uh, our three situations, pulse present, perfusion, that is normal, and you can go with the patient the following morning, the first case in the morning, that's fine, uh, or the pulse absent but perfused hand, this patient need to be a little bit urgent, and you have to check the pulsation after reduction, and you have to monitor the patient a little bit longer in the hostel or the ICU to make sure the hand perfusion is good. And uh, the other case situation, the last situation is no pulse, non-perfused hand. This means you have to go emergent, you have to call your vascular surgeon to help with the vascular uh, repair and open reduction and internal fixation. You have to pay attention to the loss category, and it comes to the test all the time. 
The other piece of uh, assessment in the neurological exam, you have to check median nerve, radial nerve, ulnar nerve, and each one has its, uh, own, its own examination. You have thumb up for the median nerve, I'm sorry, for the radial nerve, and the crossing with the fingers for the, uh, for the ulnar nerve, and the okay sign for the uh, median nerve and EIN, and you have to be familiar with the examination of the peripheral nerve as well. Uh, however, peripheral nerve uh, neuropraxia is not indication for emergent uh, uh, trip to the OR. So you have to, you can wait for the following morning. Vascular injury is indication for emergent fixation. Just to dust the uh, risk factors for different type of radial nerve with posterior lateral displacement, most likely median nerve. For radial nerve, posterior medial displacement and deflection type, always ulnar nerve. And this point come to the test what's the most common nerve injury in affliction type? It's ulnar nerve injury. Uh, remember the ulnar nerve in affliction type. Uh, imaging, I think all of us familiar with the imaging, just get the three views of the elbow and do the, uh, uh, the decision to go for surgery or uh, type one or type two or type three, you can uh, decide based on this simple x-ray. Most of the time there is no need for CT or MRI uh, for the uh, Sobracondar fractions. Uh, type one is uh, differentiation between type one and type two. Sometimes it's tricky. You have to get familiar with the some radiographic lines. And this is just the posterior fat bad sign is uh, indication for type one sobracondar fractures or called fractures of the distal humerus. And I will show you the other one. This is just Bowman angles so to know the deformity. And uh, there's some pictures here about the difference between type one and type two. Yeah, this is the one, the different sheet between type one and type two. You can see the anterior humeral line normally bisect or intersect with the uh, with the capitulum, but this is type two. You can see the type two, this the anterior humeral line does not intersect with the capitulum. This is the differentiation. Sometimes it's very, uh, very minimal radiographic finding and you have to get a better lateral view to make sure you are not missing type two uh, supracondal fractures. Most of the time we fix type two supracondal fracture type. Most of the time we just do so, uh, close the reduction and percutaneous spinning for type two supracondal fractures. Type three is obvious need surgery. Type one obvious doesn't need surgery, but type two is the one that uh, sometimes is tricky to diagnose and treat. This is the flexion type is not common, not as common as uh, extension type. And uh, it's operative treatment with any, any displacement. And uh, most of the time need open reduction and internal fixation rather than close the reduction percutaneous spinning in type three. Uh, timing, we discussed about timing. We said emergent or urgent. Emergent is very important in non-perfused limb. No pulsations, non-perfused hand. For more urgent for, more urgent for open fractures, skin buckering compromise, for ipsilateral uh, forearm and wrist fractures, there is a, the studies that show that uh, patient with uh, ipsilateral forearm fractures, the incidence of compartment syndrome up to 30% on these patients. Uh, significant displacement uh, doesn't doesn't severe displacement and shouldn't uh, wait for the next morning. You have to go in the middle of the night to fix this fracture. That we see there's a question about the neurologic injury. But most of the literature say neurological injury is not indication for uh, emergent uh, or urgent fixation uh, for supracondal fractures. Can't wait for the first case in the morning or second case, depending on your schedule. I think first case it should be good. Balsalus, but perfuse hand. This case is a little bit controversial, but the, if the patient come at 4 p.m., yes, go ahead and do it. But if the patient came like 2 a.m. in the morning or 3 a.m. in the morning, I think we can put it for the first case in the morning uh, with careful monitor of the circulation. That's, uh, that's why there's a question mark about this area. Uh, just a little bit of a technique, <clears throat> how to do the uh, surgery, just as the patient set up hand table. Some people use a C arm and rotate the C arm and use a C arm as a table. And uh, you have to put the patient, tip the patient head to the bed. So when you do traction and manipulation, the patient doesn't fall off and doesn't get extubated. You have to pay attention to all of these details for the operative or arm setup. This is how you just do the bending. 
for traction, uh, for reductions, you do traction and 30 degrees of flexion, and then the correct the coronal plane displacement, and then with your thumb pushing uh, to correct the sagittal plane with using your thumb. Uh, for arm position, you have to depend on the, the displacement. Could be pronated or could be supinated, depending on the uh, displacement of the fracture. So this is the brachialis sign. This is the milking to help with the uh, reduction. And this is the uh, rule of thumb. The thumb should should point to the direction of the initial displacement of the fracture. Look for this. The thumb here displacement, the thumb is this way. And look at the other side, the thumb in the opposite direction. You have to uh, remember pronation tightened the medial soft tissues and the supination tightened the lateral soft tissues. So you have to remember this to, uh, to know the direction of the forearm uh, during the uh, reduction techniques. Just at the pinning positions, we have the diversion. Most of the time we use lateral pace pins uh, from lateral side uh, to avoid injury to the ulnar nerve. You can see good divergence of the pins and uh, you have to make sure that all the pins are bicortical fixations and you have to uh, make sure that the wires are in the humerus and lateral view as well. This is the flexion type as well. Uh, open reduction, usually most of the time in uh, uh, failure of closer reduction is an indication for open reduction or for open injuries or fracture with vascular injuries. Uh, you do most of the time uh, open reduction tunnel fixation. So the, the reasons for not at, able to achieve an acceptable alignment, maybe association with postulator displacement or flexion type, most of the time need open uh, reduction tunnel fixation. And older kids, my observation, my patients, patient older than seven or eight years old, or even 10 closer, the older kids most of the time need open reduction tunnel fixation. Younger kids, younger kids, younger than five years old, uh, they uh, can tolerate closer reduction and percutaneous spinning. Uh, this is just to show you the, uh, uh, the distribution of the pins for, uh, to help with the, uh, with the fixation during open reduction. This is just a, the uh, incision used for the uh, vascular exploration. You have to see the uh, vascular repair, either with venous graft or thrombectomy uh, or intimate re uh, artery repair of the, of the artery, depending on the uh, severity of injury of the vascular injury. But this is to show you the anterior uh, lysias incision to help with the vascular exploration and helping with the reduction. And usually, most of the time you do bone fixation first and do the vascular repair. But if the ischemia time is longer, you can do the vascular repair first and you do the bone fixation next. Really depends on the situation. This is just the drawing to show you the difference between the vascular, I'm sorry, lateral pace pins uh, versus uh, two crossing pins and the risk of ulnar nerve uh, injury. Most of the time you can do a small incision, explode the nerve uh, down to the bone and then fire the pin uh, need the crossing of the bends above the fracture site, not at the fracture site. Uh, some French technique using from France, using the flexible nails, uh, integrated from the proximal humerus down to help with the fixation of the supracondyl fractures, one in the, the medial column, one in the lateral column, but this is not a common technique. Uh, and this adjusted the crossing pins, so the ulnar nerve are at risk. And the lateral pins, if you go higher, the radial nerve at risk. Just so this is the technique for percutaneous fixation uh, for the uh, for the sobracondyl fractures. And uh, depending on your comfort level, if you want to cast them or splint them, most of the time I cast them, do long arm cast after surgery. I use fiberglass, colorful cast, and then uh, I use very very well bedded cast with a foam and sponges to help with the uh, bedding of the cast. But some surgeons do splint for uh, one week and then come to the clinic and the switch for long arm cast uh, after. Uh, the follow-up, I usually take the pins off three weeks after to and allow active range of motion, active or assisted active range of motion of the, of the elbow. I don't, most of the time, I don't send patients for physical therapy. Most of the time, the kids restore the range of motion after a uh, few months after the surgery uh, any more reduction can cause limitation of the range of motion. 
uh, and some of the kid lose flexion, some of them lose extension, really depend on the uh, on the fracture better and you do open reduction versus close the reduction. Most patients with a close the reduction, they do well and they restore uh, the range of motion. However, patient with open reduction, some, they lose some of the range of motion uh, of the elbow, either flexion or extension or a little bit of both. And uh, do you have time? Do you have more time, Dr. Mohammed? I, I think we are out of time, Professor uh, Ahmed. That's fine. I think, yeah, that's okay. So just if anyone have questions, I know this is basic, but very important basic uh, for practicing uh, physicians to understand the basic of pediatric fractures and at least understand the most common I, 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 pediatric I, 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 fracture, supracondylar fracture. The, uh, the supracondylar fracture. Uh, you did an amazing presentation about pediatric fracture and they are very cool about the remodeling uh, potential. Uh, about supracondylar fracture, we face this debate about a, a pulseless limb after K wire fixation uh, in theater. What is your strategy for such cases? Do you remove your K wires and remanipulate the fracture and assess the pulse again? Or you call the vascular surgeon to be with in theater with, with us? So you start with the patient has non-perfused hand, no pulsations, and you do the close the reduction. Pulses didn't return back or pulses return back. What is your situation? Because a different scenario. Yeah, yes, as you said, there are different scenarios. What I'm talking about, it was a... Patient has pulse. Has pulse. And you do the reduction, and, you lose the pulse. You lost yes. the pulse. Yes. And uh, you take the wires, Take the wires off, remanipulate, and reassess the pulse with, with your hand or doubler, you either bulbable pulse or doubler pulse. If you don't have pulse, if you don't have uh, doubler, and you have, uh, you can use the pulse oximetry, oximetry to see the oxygen as well. I think this should be indication for exploration for, vas for vascular injury. Okay, this is perfect. And about the second scenario, in case of pulseless, poor perfused uh, supracondylar fracture. Uh, would you go ahead with the uh, exploration or you do the manipulation and do QR fixation and then assess the pulse and then uh, if needed, uh, do the vascular exploration? So there is pulsations, but the hand is perfused. There is no pulse, there is no uh, perfusion. No Pulseless perf cold uh, limb. Yeah, did you have to do an um, um, emergent uh, to, uh, trip to the OR and explore the pulse and reduce the fracture. Okay, so it is for, for white hand, from white the cold hand. hand, white cold hand, no pulsations. Immediate indication for exploration. Red hand, warm hand, no pulsations. You do close the reduction, monitor the patient in the ICU for some time, and you have to document the doubler and get the pulse ultimately after you finish to make sure it is 90%, over 92, 94% is a good perfuse, and then monitor the, don't send patient second, and monitor the patient longer. Most of the time, the pulsation come back because just a spasm of the artery, okay? If there is good pulsation, I'm sorry, no pulse, but the hand is perfused, mm. okay? So yeah. you reduce the fracture, fix it, monitor the patient longer, but try to heal the pulsation with the doubler to document the pulsations. And if I lose the pulse, I remanipulate okay. again. Remanipulate and you have to be ready for exploration for vascular injury. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You know, From uh, Dr. Mohammed Abdel Ayal to Mr. Uh, Ahmed Sabit, uh, about if immediate clawing uh, occurred after medial wiring, would you leave the wires or remove it? No, there is multiple techniques in order to avoid injury. Of course, if there is you, if you think that you hit the ulnar nerve with the pen, you have to take it off, definitely. If you see the finger are twitching, the fifth and fourth finger like immediate clawing, you have to take the wire off and redirect it. But in order to avoid injury for the ulnar nerve, there's multiple ways. Number one, you start with the lateral pin first because you need flexion to achieve good reduction. Once you fix the lateral pin, you have a little bit of fixation, you extend the elbow a little bit, and then you start with the medial side, and then you use a knife or a, a knife to dissect down to the bone with a snap or a mosquito down to the bone. Now you feel the bone and then you direct your pen, uh, the medial one. And also with your thumb, push the ulnar nerve posteriorly because with flexion, with more flexion, you're displacing the ulnar nerve more anterior 
the chance of injuring the ulnar nerve is high rather than you extend the elbow a little bit and then with your thumb push the ulnar nerve posteriorly and then you should be able to be uh, uh, advancing your wire without risking or damaging the ulnar nerve. Yes, if you think you're damaging the ulnar nerve, take it off and redirect the pen. Thank you.